I got to give y'all a little glimpse of what the hip hop architecture camp is. And I, I think before I go off into more about what the program is, uh, I'm open to taking questions from people and then that can help me guide you know, the next thing or things uh, that I'll show you. And one of the ultimate goals is uh, getting the program uh, set up here um, in the Bay so that we can talk about actual projects that are happening or programming initiatives or just get kids to dream about uh, their own ideas. Um, but definitely open to questions that y'all might have. I'm gonna go here, I saw you do like, and then we'll come here. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Forbes, thank you. Regarding um, San Francisco, when you go into a city to uh, promote interns or help the youth and build them up, is that a funding the city needs to have to support, or is that something you do, and how would we even get started in that um, mode. We do internship for uh, redevelopment here in San Francisco for our properties uh, through OCII, the infrastructure and um, work that's being done. All right, so good, good question. And I've gotten myself in trouble before. I'm like, yeah, the program is free. It's free for the kids, but yes, there's a fee for where we, when we come into a city and run a camp. Um, and that has been done a number of different ways. Sometimes we might team with a city planning department or a mayor's office. It might be a private developer or a college or university. It's very different, public libraries. Um, oh. But the, um, the fee for running the camp is $30,000. Uh, we usually take a max of 40 uh, young people to be involved. Um, so that includes everything for the, the camp, except for uh, the food each day. So we have the local hosts handle the food, but that includes like all of our like media teams who come out and record the young people in the music videos, um, who record their music. We have a media team that come and record the music videos, we give the kids software, all of that stuff. Um, but yeah, but that's how that works. And again, we just don't extend that fee to the young people. The idea is to be totally free. It does create challenges sometimes, right? Because, you know, how do you get kids to come every day? If mama and daddy didn't pay, you know, even if it's a couple hundred or you know, some of these programs be thousands of dollars. Um, so you don't have that investment from the young folks that make them come every day. So we just tried to create a very interesting program. Uh, we bring celebrities. Uh, we've had everybody from like Angela Yee from The Breakfast Club as a host, Damian Lillard when we do our program in Portland. Uh, if y'all don't know, he's you know, put out music. Um, so we, we get celebrities and, and people that make us look a little more cooler than what we are. And that's gonna make the kids wake up and come every day or make sure that their parents drop them off. Um, so it's $30,000, 40 kids, and um, that has been handled a lot of ways. I don't care how it's handled. Like, locals, we come in and do the, we can do the program. Like, sometimes it's like with architecture firms, it might be five or six firms who get together, um, put money together, and host a camp. Um, we've worked with city planning departments when they are doing like updates to the city comprehensive plans and they have to do community engagement. So, we've come in and led the community engagement initiative for mayor's offices or city planning departments too. And it's just a part of a budget that they already had to engage the community. All right, I know you had a question too. I want to lend a helping hand. I am one of the first black, um, I, I am the, plan, the American Planning Society's, um, uh, the APA planning, what's called the RAP the lead for San Francisco for the programming for the American Planning Association here in San Francisco. And I've also been a Pathways to Equity Fellow um, as well as a Pathways Fellow with ULI um, with Urban Plan and things. And so we welcome you here 
and want to know like anything that, you know, I, I in my role as, the, you know, one of the first black people to be actually on the board um, in this role for San Francisco, we want to make sure that we are correcting the wrongs that have been here and that we are part of our future going forward. And, we, and I see your program as, 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 you know, and it's not a lot, we've got so many architecture um, planning firms here that can sponsor and things. And I'd uh, love to partner with you to see that this bring, bring this to San Francisco. Okay, cool, cool. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely connect. I'm gonna make sure I share my, I don't know what happened to my slides. Um, I'll pull those back up so I have my contact info. Yeah, and APA has their first black woman president, national president. They're, they're planning for San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, I know, but I'm saying APA nationally yeah. has their first black yeah. woman as a president right now. Facts, facts. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll reconnect. Um, I guess, was there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm Diane from 100% Contra. And I wanted to ask you about the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. Because I know that some of the young people, it looks like the preteen, like up to about 16 or so, what is the age group that, um, that you work with? Yeah, so we go 6th through 12th grade. Um, you know, if they're if we're teaming with someone who services a certain group of young people, we'll just come in and service just that group. But if we're recruiting on our own, we recruit sixth through twelfth grade students. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I noticed Yeah, that's that's why I gotta get the slides up. Now I feel like I'm the Wizard of Oz back here now. Like, okay. Yeah. So the the question was, uh, what have young people talked about? So, like, sometimes we go and it's a very specific project that we're looking at. Like, it's a development that's going on, and we want um, young people to comment on that. Um, but then there's times when we are pretty open and free. So this was in, it's one of the years during the pandemic. We couldn't do our rap battles live. We had to do all, all of our rap battles over Zoom. <laughs> so uh, this young lady, she's in Chicago. Um, but yeah, we had like 650 young people participate in our hip hop architecture camps during the pandemic. Um, so it's just one big virtual camp. But we challenged them to design whatever they wanted in their, their neighborhood. So, uh, and then when they present their projects, they don't present it like, oh, here's the front of the building, here's the back door. They don't present how architects are taught to present. I want them to use their voice, their creativity. So they get one rap verse to present their project. Um, so this was her verse about what she wanted to see in her neighborhood. Right, so this was uh, her idea to build a community center where she wanted to have a maker space. Like they gotta put everything in their wrap. A maker space, she wanted to learn about gardening and they have to, you know, you know we teach them how to write uh, because then they have to take their lyrics and like delete the words and just look at the patterns and now use the patterns as a part of the architecture. Um, so we try to teach them to rap and let them know that their favorite rappers are not Dr. Seuss, who like has a rhyming word at the end. Like you have a lot of stuff that's happening in all the lines. So when they're writing raps, they're writing it as a visual thing more than just a sonic experience. So we're like really diving deep into 
to rap. So, and that was her project. You know, she got the internship uh, where her project got turned into something more realistic with the firm. Uh, so, it's it's all over the map. And you also have kids. It's like, yeah, I want to make a grocery store. I want to, you know, they're, they're they're learning about things that are being talked about in lyrics like food deserts, right? And then they it's like, oh yeah, I know this is not a grocery store in my neighborhood. Maybe I should do that. Um, so it's all over the map of, of what kids think. Uh, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I have a, oh, thank you. Oh, appreciate the mic. Oh, thank you. Hi, my name is Joelle Stewart. I work for the Human Rights Commission. Um, thank you for coming. Um, and I've been working on um, reparations and my background is in urban planning. I don't know why I'm saying all of this, but <laughs> just you got to the microphone. give a little like, preamble. Yeah. Um, but my background is in urban planning. And so a lot of the um, discussions we had around reparations undergirding it is that um, that idea that you talked about, you know, like the the genesis of it is rooted in redevelopment and urban renewal and things like that. And it's not lost on me that 50 years ago when hip hop was um, starting, it was a very regional, very localized sort of phenomenon. And um, in response to the conditions in cities in the Bronx at the time. But as we've moved on through the 70s, 80s, 90s, and now we see the um, I, I don't mean to make this sound like a speech. I just talk like this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but like as we continue on through this, like we see these demographic shifts in um, in cities across America. I'm wondering if you can speak about the way that we see hip hop and the way that um, its relationship to the built environment has evolved over time, and if you've observed any um, you know larger patterns in what it, you know what the subject matter is and how it relates to the urban fabric, um, because one of the most significant recent albums to me or um, is College Dropout. I'm from, originally from Chicago, and I feel like that has so much like... Um, I miss the old Kanye. Yeah, I know. I miss the old Kanye, too. Um, but yeah, I, I just... That's a lot of words. I just wonder if you can speak a little bit more about like the evolution of hip-hop in the modern era as um, it relates to people and demographic shifts. Thanks. Yeah, so... You know, that's a, a critique hip hop gets. And even when we talk about the hip hop architecture camp and I, I bring on educators or like community leaders, people to come and volunteer at the camps. So you don't have to be an architect to volunteer. Like we, we bring everybody. And one of the discussions is what lyrics are we gonna have young people explore? And people are like, well, hip hop ain't what it used to be. You know, they talking about this or that today. Today they're talking about drugs. They're, talk, like they're still talking about what's in their neighborhood. Conversations have just changed. You know, think about Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, and they made the song "The Message." Broken glass everywhere. People pissing. Like they're talking about the Bronx in the '70s, but today, as artists talk about, um, they, they're talking about new things that are in their neighborhoods. Think about Rick Ross, the real Rick Ross, and right, who talks about how he worked with government agencies to get crack cocaine into neighborhoods, right? So now you see people talk about crack in the 80s and the early 90s a lot more in music. They're still reflecting what's in their neighborhoods, what's in their environment, the policies and procedures. The only thing that's different from today, I think today versus yesterday, is the music back then was a call to action and more of a blatant, I'm exposing what's in my environment. Here is more, today, it can be seen or perceived as more of a glorification and not really pointing the finger at people who are changing our neighborhoods and environments. And, um, but no matter what, uh, again, the music today, I'm like, hey, you don't have to come to the camp and look at some old school rapper who really talked about the neighborhood that we, we think talked about neighborhoods. You can listen to Cardi B today. You can listen to Kendrick, J. Cole. It, hip hop is still critiquing the environment. It's this unsolicited, like unfiltered critique, but it's up to us to like slow down, understand it, and now how can we design something moving forward? Um, so that's a long way of saying, I'll take hip hop from all years.
Thank you very much for your inspiring and hopeful talk. I'm Savi Bisnath, and I'm the Senior Economist with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. It's a UN organization. And my question is, the, when you talk about the engagement of the, the young people, they very much talk about things that relate to human rights, the right to a, a adequate housing, affordable housing, the right to food because of the food deserts in communities. Do, do they link it with rights? And the reason I ask is because with rights, we have the law and we have policies and we have things that can we can use the way Dr. King invoked when he spoke about civil and political rights to change some of the realities on the ground. And I'm asking if, they, if you help them to make those links so they can imagine a different mm -hmm. community in terms of the built environment, but also concretely work towards structural changes. Thanks. Yeah, great, great question. I would say we could talk about it even more when we partner with your office, all right, because we can be very specific and create or adjust curricula to lead to that discussion. But uh, yes, we have done that. You know, we've even put on a, like a national competition for young people. Uh, so this was done with a rapper Lupe Fiasco out of Chicago. Um, he has a song um, called All Black Everything where he reimagines people as different people. Um, and how would the world be different if this person wasn't black, but he was white, or this white person was black, or very creative song. But um, we held a competition where we had young people go through lyrics from any rapper they wanted to, and then design a product space or place that would advance rights for people. Um, so it was everything from young know, people designing apps to the future of um, affordable housing, but all of their prompts had to be tied directly to a, a rap lyric. So this was an international competition we had, which was and we didn't want to call it a competition. It really wasn't a competition. Somebody did win prizes. Everybody won for participating, but it was directly related to that idea of how do we um, use rap lyrics to call attention to situations like human rights, but how do we now respond to it? And at that time, we were, you know, I made this statement that Lupe was like, oh, that was interesting. I said, as architects and urban planners, are we content? with designing the backdrops to injustice, all right? All of the things you're seeing on the news are happening in spaces and places that somebody designed. And if you've ever been involved with designing a building or a park or anything, if you've been part of that discussion, we go through everything that could possibly happen in that space and we design for it. At no point do we ever say, all right, and a person's gonna die right here, all right? And some architects are like, well, I just build spaces. I don't have a right to discuss what happens after I build it. So we wanted to challenge people to say, you know, you don't build a backdrops to injustice or we shouldn't be complacent with building that. How do we get involved with what's happening in our spaces after we create them? Uh, and that's where the lyric competition came into, came into play. But we should connect and I'll show you what we did. Yeah, there's one more and we'll come up here. Hey, thank you. Uh, my name is Alonzo. I'm from the Office of Health Equity. Um, I was just curious about your summer program. What is the length of the program? And what are the pre-requirements for the youth joining the program is my second question. The third one is, out of all the work you've done in teaching them how to write raps and everything, what are your objectives with this program overall and how you can replicate that in different areas when you go? Thank you. Yeah, so the, the prerequisites are none. I just, what's that? One more. Uh, we'll, we'll do one, one more and then I'm gonna try to show, well, we'll do two more, three more. <laughs> I, I'm gonna keep my answer shorter so I can show y'all stuff. I'm, I wanna talk, but I want y'all to see the kids too. I want y'all to see their genius. Um, but the prerequisites, they're none. Uh, only thing that we, we do, I mean, we're 
There we go. We're, we're targeting black and brown children. So that's who we are looking to bring into the program. Um, the only thing that we ask is that, and we have this in our application process, that you're interested in both hip hop and architecture. In the past, we didn't do that. And you get kids who come, they're like, yeah, I just want to be an architect. I don't know about this music thing. And they don't want to rap. They're scared. And then you have kids that's like, I'm just here to rap, bro. I'm, I'm here for the music video. It's like, but you got to do the architecture part, too. So you got to be interested in both. Uh, and then the length of the program um, is five days. So Monday through Friday. Um, it's an all-day program. And then we have a six-day, which usually happens about two weeks after the camp is concluded where we do a music video reveal. So back, we just did one in Dallas, brought all the kids back, their parents, they can invite friends. We got a theater at the Holocaust Museum and the museum rolled out the red carpet for the kids and they got to watch that music video for the first time together. Um, we're doing it in Memphis next week. Uh, in Memphis, our project was designing a skate park in memory of Tyree Nichols. Um, and, and we actually, that was actually our project across the country this year. When I seen uh, Miss uh, Rovine Wells on TV, like this was during one of our planning sessions. She talked about her son loving sunsets and loving to skate. And if anything, she would build a skate park for him one day. So I had all the kids like design skate parks in his memory. Uh, Lupe got involved, you know, kick push himself. He came to the camps. Uh, and then to my surprise, Miss Wells, like his mother, his dad, his brothers, his whole family, they came to one of the camps uh, with the kids. So and now I'm designing the, the skate park for Tyree Nichols. With, um, but yeah, that's a little summary. And we're going to come to you next. There's one more back there. Yeah, I was just going to say there's this like um, national conversation happening about revitalizing downtowns. And I'm wondering, from your perspective, what is the political class missing in that conversation? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a good question. So the very first camp was a camp with, it was in Madison, Wisconsin. It was a partnership with the mayor's office in the city of Madison's planning department. So they were updating the comprehensive plan. So looking things like 30 years into the future, like what were, what were they gonna focus on? I was the only black person at any of these planning sessions besides a city council person. I think she had to be there. Um, so I was like, yeah, we are looking at 30 years into the city's future. And you have the, you know, the questions where you do the clickers and the answers show up. They always had asked demographic questions. So the median age there was like 53. Um, like, so you're thinking 30 years into the future. So these people are going to be 83 by the time this is implemented, like we missing the mark. So that's how I propose the hip hop architecture camp. But I think what they're missing is, they're like, oh, we gotta get black folks to the table. We gotta really understand what they want in their neighborhoods, what they think about what we're doing. Like, yeah, we've been saying that shit for 50 years. Hip hop is 50 years. And before hip hop, if you don't like hip hop, you go to the blues, right? All of our music has been a reflection of the built environment. Unfortunately, people have been dancing to it as opposed to responding to it. So it's really people need to learn some critical listening skills like in how to listen to hip hop. And that's what I think we do at the camp and getting young people to be better than their peers because they're better listeners. Um, but yeah, I think that's what's missing is it's like, yo, I need to hear what black folks and brown folks are saying We've already said it. We just didn't do it in that way where we had to write it into this box. All right? It was like unsolicited and again, unfiltered and raw. Thank you. Grand Rising, and thank you for coming. It's been really interesting. I am Tony Hines, and I have a community healing business called Why Not Unite for Peace. And I'm blessed to be surrounded by a lot of young male rappers. I have a 16 year old grandson who lives with me. All he and his friends are rappers. And I would like to know, do you, you know any resources you could share that could, before you come and do your work, to do some pre-work to translate what you're just saying to be a better listener or to translate it to math or just something, because they in my house eating my food, so <laughs> take them lyrics and do some math. Oh, man. 
I want to make sure I don't feel bad after I say this, but I'm going to say it. I don't know. Everybody not a fan of AI. Um, but I will say Google and both Microsoft just put out some very interesting uh, artificial intelligence tools uh, that they might be interested in. Um, and I'm blanking on the name of both of them. Google, Google put out one. This was less than a month ago. Um, but I would, what the two is doing, they're, they're challenging people who think they can rap or who can rap but want to advance like the topics and things that they have in their music. But uh, they give like short writing prompts. And it's, um, if they follow, I, I think one of the best examples, I've said Lupe name like three times now, but he, he actually created the tool with Google. He did a residency at MIT and created this tool. Um, it's like teaching the AI how to rap and now how can AI help young people learn how to rap. Well, I think that would be great because you can put any topic, right? You want to talk about food deserts? All right, now let's get your bar straight so you can talk about this in a way that you really understand it. Yeah, I'm... Generative AI, is that it? That's the Google one? Generative, no, it's called something else. What is it? B-A-R-D. Bard. Bard. Appreciate y'all, appreciate y'all. I know we had another question. One here and then one there. Okay. Hello, peace everyone. Um, my name is Erica. I'm executive assistant over at the Village Project under Ms. Adrienne Williams. Uh, we run year-round children's programs, um, ages 5 through 17. Uh, we focus on literacy, um, learning of basic life skills, and cultural arts. I'm just wondering if you have an introductory um, book or any type of literature or maybe um, activities that we could use to spark interest uh, for these children where they can do things that are hands-on or they can apply things to practical everyday um, things. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Short answer, no. I do not have anything. So the uh, question a few questions back, say what's the ultimate goal? That is one of my ultimate goals, is how do I disseminate this curricula where a little broader where I or people that I work with uh, don't have to be in the space to deliver the curriculum. So that, that is one of the goals. Right now it's a very personal, we are there delivering the, the program. So yeah, looking for partners to help do that. How do we widen or share it where, um, again, I don't have to be there. Also hire a lot of students from HBCU so they get travel grants. These are graduate students um, and some undergrads they get to go to a brand new city for a week, they get paid, they work with me to get trained in the curriculum, they get to engage with young folks and see architecture in a new city. Um, but how can we, again, have it where even they don't have to travel to go somewhere? That's one of my ultimate goals. What's up, man? Uh, my name's Kafri J. I'm from Hunters Point, not Bayview. Um, I'm a hip-hop organizer, educator, business consultant. I run hip-hop for the future, and for 10 and 15 years, I've been trying to get philanthropy to understand hip-hop, not to mention, you know, regular people to understand it's the strongest organizing force we have on the block anyway. Um, but what kind of hurdles have you faced trying to get your work funded uh, or even accepted just being rooted in hip-hop culture? Man. First, that's a, that's a nice T-shirt, too. I need one of those. T-shirt say, fuck your racist grandma. <laughs> I need, I need a couple of those. Um, but, so, in architecture, it's not, I guess, unsimilar to other professions, like, but architecture being accepted by bringing hip hop, I didn't check it at the door, I brought it in with me. So it's this little thing about architecture, like you get a degree, you get a master's degree, then you gotta take all these exams, you gotta practice, and then eventually you could be called an architect after you pass the exams and you've done so much practice. Me, I'm young, I'm like, fuck that. Like, I spent all this money, you gonna call me an architect. Um, and, you know, I would get letters from people like, hey, I heard, you know, an article written about you and they called you an architect. Maybe you wanna tell them that you're not an architect, you're a designer. 
like, fuck you. Like, you got the time to actually, like, gatekeep the word architect. It's like hair architects, information architects. It's all these people who call themselves architects. Um, so that was, like, one of the early hur hurdles when I was younger. But then I'm like, you know what? I'm going to call myself the hip-hop architect. Like, Dr. Dre ain't no doctor. You make everybody call him doctor. <laughs> and then the American Institute of Architects, like our national um, governing body, had me come in and keynote. So I was keynote next to Michelle Obama. It was her first keynote out of the White House. Um, and I wasn't licensed at that time. And they called me up on the stage, like, the hip-hop architect. So I was like, had this like finger to everybody, like, yeah, y'all heard that? Like, they called me the hip-hop architect. But it wasn't accepted because people are like, oh, these things don't go together. But they do. So it really was educating people that uh, these two seemingly unrelated things are, are definitely related. And then I got to a point where I was like, you know what? Maybe I don't want to educate other people so much. I'm not looking for their validation. How can I hit the potential funders who are interested um, and not spend so much time trying to convince folks or let them validate me because as soon as they validate me, they can invalidate me, right? They can cancel me. So I went a different route. I didn't go through like traditional funding means. Uh, all of my initial funding was outside of like architecture groups or anybody involved with architecture. It was all um, like public libraries or, I'm sorry, public libraries or um, again, city officials. Uh, I think the first major funder that was related to architecture was here in San Francisco, a company called Autodesk. Um, they were the first partners, like, A, they seen one of the rap videos online, they're like, okay, we need more kids rapping about architecture. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard. How do you get people to accept it? I think you just got to find the right audience. Um, and I also believe in guilt money, too. We stopping at 1230? I don't know. Who has I can, time. yeah, I think it's at 1230. We'll, we'll do two more, and okay. then we, I want to show you all some stuff, and they might have some questions after that, too. So we'll go there, and then we'll end it with you. Um, yeah, this is really exciting stuff. Thanks so much for bringing it to us. Um, there's kind of two movements people are talking about, bringing more nature into the urban and built environment and bringing black and brown kids and people into nature. So, I mean, you've had brilliant insights on everything you've talked about. I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. No, I believe in that opportunity to have that moment of solace outside of the, the noise and movement of the city. You know, people like, you know, Robert Smith, you know, he has a, a program I've been involved with for a couple of years now where he takes young people from cities across the country and take them out to Colorado, um, you know, into the mountains for a couple of weeks just to get away from the city. Um, well, I totally, I'm, I'm with that. And um, how do you bring more greenery into cities? I think it becomes one of those challenging discussions. Um, is how do you have people in those cities that you're trying to bring that greenery, greenery into involved with it? Because most of the time when greenery has come into our city, it's like, it was eroding or removing something, right? Like Central Park is not just Central Park. I mean, it was a black neighborhood. Um, you know, I'm in Dallas now. I just learned of a major park we have downtown was a black neighborhood. Um, so how do you do that in, in ways that are beneficial to the residents? It's got like bike lanes that are popping up everywhere. It's like it's like the first sign of gentrification. It's like, oh, there's that bike line. And um, that, that bike lane also means that it's not just an individual movement to gentrify. Like, they, the city is now behind this, right? It, it's now a, a, a larger discussion that's happening. Uh, so how do you get residents involved with those uh, initiatives? I think it's the challenge. It's not the challenge, but it's, it's key to, for the, to the success. Hi. My name is Brianna Frierson. I work with the Hope SF Initiative, which we work with the four low-income neighborhoods in San Francisco. 
um, would love to have you work with us. That's one. But I really wanted you, if you could speak about like what your program is doing for the youth. How are they feeling knowing that going through this, the, the lyrics that they're making are literally impacting change, impacting the way their neighborhood looks, the way their cities look, and knowing that you gave them you empower them to use their voices to do so, and they can now effectively see that change, whereas like, you know, as youth, everybody above you is making all of the decisions. So yeah, just speak to how, how they feel. Well, first, some students are like, <laughs> the first day, they don't, they don't know what to expect. Um, we don't tell them about any celebrities that's coming to the camp, because then the parents gonna be there and. It's like the delayed drop off, they just hanging around. So we don't tell them nothing about any celebrity that's coming. Um, so the, at first day it's awkward, everybody's quiet. They reading lyrics, like, ah, what is this? Um, but when we get to like that second day and we're starting to build things, like they're now seeing that this is a tool that one makes them not makes them appear, but it shows that they are smarter than most other kids, right? The fact that they can decipher all of these lyrics, they can extract the math, or like some people can't even hear rap. Like you cut it on, it's like, I don't know nothing they saying. I can't, our kids can keep up with it. Our kids can freestyle, right? Because we also have kids rap. So they can freestyle, they, they're doing math, like they're calculating bars and how long sentences need to be and sometimes on a beat that they never heard, right? So they're doing like all this complex stuff. So at the end, like they're feeling like, man, I am a genius. Like they, they walk away feeling that they're extremely smart. And then when you add to it any celebrity that might come to a camp, uh, the fact that they, um, I, we've never had, you know, sometimes they say you never want to meet a celebrity because then like the mystique of them is gone and you know like the real one, you're like, ah. We've never had that experience at the camp. Um, everybody that's come in has been like very uh, attentive to the young folks and genuinely shocked. So uh, like in St. Louis, uh, this was my college soundtrack. I went back on the kids. We had Chingy come to the camp. He was like the soundtrack to my years in college. But he came to the camp and just like everybody else, like you come in and you see these models, whether it's on a computer or something physical, and most of the time, you're like, oh, that's cute. You know, you think you need to be engaged. Like, oh, that's cute. Good. Keep going, young lady. Keep going, young guy. But when they get to see, and I'm going to show you all some images, like, this is, like, Chingy, this is your song, bro. Like, the rappers now, they start to hold it in their hands, and they want to make more music because they think they can make music that's visually more complexing. So rappers, and, and I'm going to show you all a session we did here in San Francisco back in, like, 2018. So we brought a group of rappers from across the country to Autodesk headquarters, and we ran a session, a camp, just like we do for kids, but it was for all rappers, all adults. And they had rap battles where you never heard them rapping. You just put on virtual reality, and you like walk through their words. And it'd be whack or like not as complex as the next person. They'll go back, rewrite something, get it rebuilt, put on a headset, and you walk through it again. So they were having rap battles that were like, building cities. It was pretty dope. But I think the kids walk away knowing that like I'm a genius. Like that's that's what I want them to walk away feeling. Um cool. Thanks for those questions. Uh I'm gonna I see the screen keep like blinking. It's not me that's doing it. But I think I can walk y'all through some images. Uh, I might have to click it with my hand. Okay, no. Oh, there we go, yes. All right, so this was the, the event we did in San Francisco. So we had like about 40 people that came here. Um, so uh, Lupe, he invited all the rappers I invited like the architects and designers. And um, so we had battle rappers like this guy, his name is Daylight. He got like a spawn tattoo on his face. 
So it's dope, like walking around Auto Autodesk headquarters with him. Uh, walk around their offices. Uh, the guy next to him is a rapper named Chino Excel. Uh, then I had, again, like architects and designers. But we went and we ran them through a camp. But it was for all, all four adults. Um, we had tech partners that came in. And we challenged them to write music on the spot. And then how can we visualize the music? So now our diagram started to become <laughs> a little more complex. I don't know what's going on with that blanket. Um, we started to make like more complex models and diagrams. We started to create things like can people... I usually want to get architect, you want to teach somebody about architecture or urban planning, you give them a pen or a pencil and try to get them to sketch. We're like, no, nah, like, let's create an app on a spot where you can like rap into it. You can rap into your phone and as you rap into your phone, like geometry is created based on the words that you say. So how can we really let their genius be uh, explored? And this was us. Now, uh, this one of my boys from Detroit, uh, actually wrote some of the scenes for 8 Mile. Uh, she's like real dope lyricist, um, but he's walking through a city that he just rapped about. So heights of buildings could be based on like something as simple as how many letters are in a word, to something as complex as, uh, again, like double entendres or however many entendres they put into it, how many syllables. Uh, but they had a whole rap battle without you ever hearing a rap. It'll be them writing something, working with an architect, and then we walk through it. Um, and then it got crazy where people started to do stuff like this. Um, they wanted to outdo each other. So he wrapped himself with a sheet of paper. It, it had some rap lyrics on it. He came out and said, hey, do y'all can y'all guess what I'm doing? And we're like... I don't know, it's going off the deep end, you, but you're walking around with this piece of paper on you. He's like, no, I just rap myself. <laughs> we're like, oh, I get it, you wrapped yourself. So then we're like, yo, yo, can we actually do that? So again, we start to look at music and take textiles, like can this turn into textiles? Um, and then we literally made uh, jackets that are textiles from lyrics. So we were teaching the rappers at this point how they can use their voice and their creativity to now get into another field, right? A fashion design or, or other avenues where they don't have to become a person that can sketch or draw or do this. Like, How can your voice and what you do lend itself to something different? So I would give these away to special guests when they come to the camp. It'll be their music um, and of course, just like with the kids, they look at me like, what is this? I'm like, yo, it's your song. We go through the whole thing. They discover their, their song and they're excited. Um, and I gave it to the boy who, my guy who eventually, I mean, who originally came up with the idea. I said, hey, here's one of your jackets. He's like, no, it's a rap. Call it a rap. All right, it's a rap. So we never call them jackets. We call them raps. Um, and then the other thing that has come out of the camps that we do for young folks. Um, I, as I meet more artists or we partner with different organizations, man, this thing is really driving. Yeah. Like, I'm gonna like fall over, like, what? It's like leaking in and out. But uh, we always learned that uh, hip hop artists have like different initiatives. And like, how can we get kids to not just um, create a concept for something, but how can we actually get things built? Um, so we started a program called Hip Hop uh, for Humanity. Um, and it was a special program for me when we started it because of our first project. But uh, this is where I grew up. I grew up in the city of Highland Park, Michigan. This is Detroit. It's like the freeway like, uh, separates us. But Highland Park, got we had all of our thunder stole by Detroit. Highland Park is where Henry Ford started the assembly line, it wasn't Detroit. But uh, this is where I grew up, this is where my wife grew up. Uh, but we never knew each other, we went to the same elementary, middle school, and high school. Uh, but never knew each other till like one day we're walking down the street, college is done, we're both working downtown, we pass each other, it's like, I think I know you from somewhere. 
and we started dating and put all the pieces together. Uh, but I learned later that the house she grew up in all that time did not have um, running water. So she grew up in a house with no water uh, until you know, she got adopted by her grandmother and high school, you know, finally had running water in her house. Uh, but it caused health issues, um, including us never being able to have a baby and other things that impacts the lives of, you can imagine somebody living with no running water. Um, so I met this young lady, Dr. Kulea. Uh, she grew up as a part of the Samburu tribe in Kenya. So that's about four hours north of um, Nairobi. So I met her uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, President Obama had mentioned her as a person who gives him hope on one of his uh, presidential campaign trails. Um, so she has this program called Samburu Girls Foundation. They do a lot of self-construction. Um, she has over 400 girls who live on the campus, but they don't have running water. So when I heard it, I'm like, all right, I'm a, we're gonna try to figure something out right here. So, um, so that's me and my wife. We went there, we ran a camp for the young folks uh, where we got them to design their campus, like what other buildings would they want on their campus. These are young girls that she rescues from like, from traditional practices that are now illegal, like female genital mutilation, um, early marriage, et cetera. Like Dr. Kulea would go and like literally like snatch a girl from a wedding. It's like, what you gonna do? Are you gonna call the police and say that I snatched a young girl you was trying to marry? So yeah, she gangster. Um, and then she bring them to her to Timberwu Girls Foundation, pays for their schooling and all of that. Uh, but again, never had the funding needed to really build a campus out like she wants to. So we ran a camp. They made music about it. And my goal was to have hip hop artists now fund different buildings that they wanted to create on campus. But to my surprise, uh, there was a hip hop artist, uh, again, uh, Lupe Fiasco, he's on the board for the hip hop architecture camp. But he started, or helped start a company called um, Zero Mass Water. It's now called Source. But they create these panels, it's like a solar panel, but it's a hydro panel, you probably have heard of them before. They make they like take water vapor out of the air and turns it into drinking water. But as a surprise to the young people at the end of the camp, uh, they installed enough of these panels to give all the girls drinking water. Um, and it wasn't just drinking water, it was like water that they can use for cooking, bathing, like all of that. But they installed enough panels to generate the water. So that's me and Dr. Kool-Aid, you see how tall she is? She's like super tall. Um, and then it's my wife, so she got to come over there, play with some of the girls, share her story. So just the idea that now we're using hip hop, you know, Lupe has a song, Hip Hop Saved My Life. So that's what we, you know, you know kind of dedicated the song to, I mean, the project to. And, um, you know, for my wife, it's kind of a full circle moment knowing that at least these young girls won't face some of the same challenges uh, that, that she faced, but, but all through the power uh, of hip hop. And then we always got to have rappers involved. So uh, this rapper's name is Lamarte. He came down from Nairobi to perform when we did the ribbon cutting. And that's me on the camera, so it's like shaky and crazy. Yeah, so, you know, we, that's another step where we want to get back to. Like now that the pandemic is over and, you know, it's a lot of hip hop artists who do a lot of work for good. Like how do we get young people involved with those projects? Um, question, yes. Young man, you are just amazing, and what you're doing is so impactful. One of my thoughts when you said earlier, how do we get those that either don't fully understand or embrace fully the hip hop art, not because they don't like it, but I'm a baby boomer, 
77. So I don't understand it often because of it goes so fast, I can't follow them. Mm -hmm. But in terms of hip hop, do you also incorporate the inclusiveness of training your artists um, in places of respect? Some of the things that may hold me back um, as clergy, as an older person, when I came up, we always embraced respect and dignity and honor and pride. And so when you think of certain things you don't say around folks that are too young, children, words you won't use, do you use that radio language where they bleep it or teach them to uh, cross generations with their music, reach people, that would love, and there's many of your messages I just love, embrace, use, work with, but when it gets to certain words, you wanna pull out the children, and because it's not for them. And then as an older person, they're getting disrespectful now. That's where I go with it. So do you do things to help teach and train them how to stay generational, cross borders, and include and respect, you know, with the dignity for your nation, for your people. So two different answers to that. One, our young folks, yeah, they, they're listening to all PG-13 lyrics. I'm not having somebody, mama or daddy, run up on me if their kids came home cussing about something. So yeah, all of our young kids use, you know, it, it's all clean lyrics. It's not even bleeped lyrics. Right? It's just lyrics get straight to the point of what we're trying to discuss. Now, if I'm working with college students, I have an ongoing college course, uh, one that I just ran at University of Missouri. I'm running it now at University of Detroit. Um, yeah, it's no such thing as a filter there. And hip hop is largely consumed by people who don't look like us. The biggest consumers of hip hop is not us. We're not buying the albums. We're not going to the concerts. Um, so what I like to do is flip the script in those classrooms and it's very unfiltered in the classrooms. And these are, um, it's not just architecture classes, it's a, like a cross disciplinary course that I run where we've created a, um, a rubric where you can score the relevancy of a rapper to a project that you might be doing, right? So you can look at, let's say you're building a park a green space, uh, we've created something like a, in architecture, called like a lead checklist, like you're building a green building, or like, you know, it's, it's something called lead, it's like all these things you need to check off, so your building be rated as a sustainable building. We created a rating for rap. So if you're building a park, we created a rating system where you can go and see what everybody has said about parks, but it's not PG-13 at all. It's like raw, we don't cut anything out. So I think our curriculum is age appropriate, but I will say too, what I love about hip hop is hip hop don't care about none of that. <laughs> like it's, it's for who it's for. Um, they're not trying to be appropriate. There's no such thing as appropriate. You can't be appropriate with people who haven't been appropriate with you. And sometimes you gotta be blunt. So, and, and if Cardi B made a song that your five-year-old loves, it's less her fault, it's more your fault that <laughs> your five-year-old got access to it. <laughs> what about Sexy Red? No, <laughs> we got one right. <laughs> Hello, thank you for coming here today. My name is Hattie White. I'm with Young Community Developers. I'm a site director up here in Betrayal Hill that's also experiencing redevelopment and change. However, we have not had the luxury of having African American designers be part of our system and what's the next steps. I've heard a lot of questions and comments around the youth. My big one for you is like a call of action. What things are in place to bring you to our city or nearby so we can get kids activated in these spaces and with these skill sets yeah yes and yeah thanks for that too I mean I would say just related to that comment first uh, I'm gonna share my contact info again but um, I'm putting the ball in y'all court to like reach out and make it happen I know it's a lot of conversations for people I might meet uh, but really just speaking humbly saying 
follow up, reach out so we can get the conversation going. Um, but getting architects involved with projects like that, um, you know, two resources I give out. Uh, one is the yeah, NOMA National Organization of Minority Architects. Um, you know, so all of the black architects and soon to be architects around the country, most of us are a part of that organization. Um, so being able to, if you wanted to speak directly to all the black architects, you want to speak to firm owners like myself. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, it's, it's getting in touch with those organizations. Like what we do at NOMA, we had a partnership with the UN, for example, like bringing a UN in to speak to all the black architects around the country to, one, educate us on how to actually go after those projects. How do we know when those projects are happening and becoming available? Also looking at the RFP processes. So when cities put out RFPs, a lot of times it's very, it excludes just in the way that it's written, it might exclude us from being able to work on a project. For example, my firm, small firm, it's eight of us, uh, got nice size projects. Like the Hip Hop Museum you know, is $49 million working on a Black Inventors Hall of Fame in Newark, New Jersey, another museum dedicated to like, black inventors. But sometimes the RFP might come out for a project and it's like, you need to have five buildings in the last five years with at least a $100 million, like, like, yo, what? Now it's only the same people who get these projects who are even able to get the projects, right? So it's starting to look at, it's starting to look at how proposals go out. And that's why a lot of black firms that exist, they eventually dissolve or get bought out by a larger firm because they can't go after certain projects, right? So how do you sustain your employees, right? Um, so that's, that's an issue I know with cities and states. Uh, even for, if you wanna develop projects, you know, they look for developers with certain amount of liquid cash, you know, or assets. Um, it's like, yeah, I don't have 100 million, but I can develop this project in my neighborhood if you gave me an opportunity instead of somebody halfway across the country. So it's starting to dig into how proposals are put out there that makes it uh, accessible to more diverse professionals. Hi, my name is Lynette Mackey. Um, I'm the CEO of Mackey's Corner. It's a suicide awareness and prevention. I wanna thank you for everything you presented today. Amazing, amazing. I do also, on the side, I do trips to Africa, to Kenya. and. With all the people that we get, we give back to Kenya. I'm interested in giving back to that organization. I'm interested in our donations that we bring from the US, which we get a lot. Last time we just went, this year, we bought beds, mattresses for the entire village that, was, that we adopted. I'm interested in helping that organization. That really touched me. Yeah, well, I'll definitely share that information. But yes, Samburu Girls Foundation. The name of the organization, Samburu Girls Foundation. Um, they are in Marlau, um, Kenya. So, yeah, if y'all haven't been to Kenya, it's like one of the best trips I ever took. So we spent time in Nairobi. So we was in a big city, um, which to me was like being in Chicago. <laughs> we was there for like three weeks, and then we went from the city to the countryside, and. Um, yeah, it was it was amazing being out there. But I'll I'll definitely share their information with you. I only took one, so I put me in your luggage so I can go back. <laughs> um, yeah, you have two more questions. Yeah, I'm gonna show y'all one more thing. Uh, we can maybe start in the back, and then we'll come up here. Uh, I just want to ditto that I think we're all really impressed with the work that you have already done and are doing, so thank you for that. I have a question around how architecture can impact in a city like San Francisco where we don't have a lot of space to build new, and if the architecture can be part of sort of reimagining 
spaces or buildings that already exist. Um, yeah, I think that's basically my question because we have no real estate. Like everything is already uh, here, but we are trying to sort of reimagine some of these spaces as they close and we, we reopen them, especially in our gentrified neighborhoods. And just wondering about, you know, like if that's like even possible or do you mostly just work on ground up projects? Well, I mean, what I work on is anything that improves the quality of life. I'll say that. That is my criteria for a project. Um, so whether that's ground up or renovation, uh, as long as I can say it does that, I work on it. But I, I think one of the things that people are starting to look at, which I'm sure is a conversation here, is looking at zoning and what buildings are zoned for and how can we, like office spaces, right? As people now are embracing that work from home on a more permanent basis, how do you start looking at office spaces being renovated into housing? Um, where I'm from, Detroit, you know, a lot of the public schools, Detroit students population drastically reduced. How can you start looking at schools as uh, places for living? So I, I think it's like zoning is one thing that can be addressed or that would need to be addressed. Um, as you start looking at new spaces and, and how those spaces might be used around the city, that's one of the many things that can be discussed. Uh, but zoning is a is, is a big thing on that list. All right, and then I got one more. Yes, ma'am. Um, hi, my name is Kamari um, in the Human Rights Commission um, from Opportunities for All. So we focus a lot around workforce development for youth. And one of my questions when you mentioned the prerequisites of being interested in both architecture and hip hop, I wanted to know if you could speak towards students that not necessarily had any interest towards architecture, like what were the challenges around that? Because I feel like specifically around like black architectures, a lot of the issues is with exposure, like that's not something that kids are being exposed to. I worked in education before. We're not talking about like what these different job opportunities could look like. So what do you envision that for San Francisco and what were the challenges for students who are like, oh, I, I can never do that or I don't even see like that I'm more interested in the hip hop, but like how, what were their challenges and what was that like? Yeah, I mean, again, for us, we want people to have a, an interest. Like you fill out the application to be a part of the program um, I mean, if you just didn't check the box that you would be interested in um, exploring architecture during the camp, you just won't be accepted. Um, but we we still have people who check the box anyway. <laughs> they just show up. Um, and you know, our kids ain't bashful at all. So um, what what I love about the hip hop community is I can tell you that architecture is cool. I can say it's great. I can talk to him blue in the face, but I won't be able to reach a kid like somebody who really got the pulse of the community, like a, a hip hop artist, right? If they echo my message, it makes it that much easier for me. So um, for instance, in Memphis, we had a camp and there was a young man there who actually killed the rap battle in the music video. But the first three days we're looking at architecture, he was disengaged. Um, but a rapper came in, uh, well, a couple of rappers, but one of them reached out to him during a camp. I was like, you know, I know that you're not really engaged. I can tell you're here for the music, but I don't want to hear nothing you're rapping about if you ain't doing the architecture. That was enough to make him do the architecture. The fact that he wanted this rapper to hear him rap, so he was like, oh. And then after he did it, he was like, oh, this ain't so bad, right? He actually started to enjoy taking his words and turning it into something new. But it's being able to leverage the voice of the culture to like push our messages forward. And President Obama did it to mobilize first time voters, right? Voting, we can all talk about, hey, you should vote, but the moment you get somebody of stature to say it, uh, it, it, it changes the the impact of what you're trying to get out there. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of young people who, I won't say a lot, there's a number of young folks who were not interested, they still checked the box, but after the camp, 
like they came the next year because they had so much fun. So we got a lot of repeat um, participants as well. And they know when they come the second time, they got to do the architecture. So they just fall in line. Um, but then one last thing I wanted to show y'all was, you know, how do you get, the other thing is getting brands and, you know, partners. So a lot of times I go and I do these talks and then people come up to me after it's like, yo, what's your annual budget? I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to see what I get next year. We'll see what we can do, right? It's no, you know, millions of dollars of grants that we have. Um, like, and I joke with people like the American Planning Association. I know it's a sister here from them. The American Institute of Architects. I say, hey, y'all have invested like millions of dollars into this idea every year of like diversifying our architecture and planning professions. Millions of dollars every year you put into it and all you can show is like 2% of the profession is black. Give me that money, I can't fuck it up. No more than y'all have already <laughs> fucked it up. Um, but then that message don't go over well, because I always say, I can't fuck it up no more than y'all fucked it up. I, I never take those words out. Yeah, so I let them know. But there are um, organizations I partner with who've seen the program and now they've gotten involved. So one is Shaw Contract. Uh, so Shaw is a carpet company and they seen the process that we have done uh, where I teach kids how to break down music and lyrics and create these textures and patterns. So they approached me about making a rug line. So Shaw is like the largest carpet manufacturer in the world. So probably the carpet that we're on now, I wouldn't be surprised if it's from Shaw. Like they do stadiums, they do um, hotels, airports, et cetera. Um, they're based in Georgia, but they reached out to me. It's like, hey, how can we help? How can we use our brand? Uh, so not only did they give us funds to run hip hop architecture camps, uh, but then they collaborated with me to make a rug line and then the proceeds from the rug line uh, go to support the hip hop architecture camps. Um, and then it, they let me you know, design a product so it's my first time designing something outside of architecture. And it won like the best flooring product of 2023 in the world, which is dope. Uh, so it's very nerdy, like interior design conference, which I probably would never go to. It's like where all the new products come out, but this was the best product. And all of them are based, it's five rugs, each one of them based on something in hip hop. Like this one, I based it on like how DJs used to carry records. So looking at the textures and the patterns and Oh, I did not show the chair, but I, I, I will show that one. Um, I want you to do a chair with us. <laughs> we definitely could do that. So this, this program was a brand now like saying, how can we put our brand behind this mission? Uh, but they didn't just want to teach kids about architecture. They wanted to introduce kids to like making rugs, making textiles. So um, you know, we have a new program we started with them. And um, that's me with Tyree Nichols' mother after the camp, it's all his brothers and his dad. Um, we're talking about building the park. Um, but then I'll end with this one. Um, it's another project where another brand, like they learned about the message. It's like, hey, we can give you money to do a camp, but how can we do more? Um, so I made this, um, check my time, we good? I can show this one? Like, all right. Um, so I made a, a mural when, um, you know, all the downtowns were closing and boarding up the buildings downtown during the uprising, so 2020. Um, so I painted a mural on one of the buildings in downtown Madison, Wisconsin, and it was one strike for every second that Officer Chauvin had his knee on George Floyd's neck. I called it 526 missed opportunities. Um, people could have stopped that from happening. I made it on this mural. This lady came and crossed out all of the tick marks. <laughs> she was mad about it. it. It was ridiculous. Ended up stalking me. I had to get like a, a PPO on this lady. Uh, it was like crazy. But this company, Herman Miller, seen it. They seen me on the news talking about it. And they reached out. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip some of the background and just show you all the chair. Um, Ice Cube, y'all didn't know, he got a degree in architectural drafting. He wanted to be an architect before he was a rapper. And he 
said that this architect is his favorite architect. So this chair is owned by that company, Herman Miller. And they asked me what can they do when they seen everything that was happening. Um, I said, give me one of those chairs, I'm gonna make a mural on the chair. And every interior designer, every architect who comes to your website, I want this to be on your landing page. So they agreed, they sent me the chair. The chair's like $6,000, so I will probably never buy on my own. <laughs> but the next day, the chair was like at my house. I'm like, okay, here we go. So what I did is I stripped it. It's usually like this wood chair. It's like this very like modern piece, like some beautiful chair. Yeah, they, amazing company. Um, but this is their like most luxurious piece. And um, so I stripped all the wood off, went to my Detroit roots. I had this guy who paint cars, he painted the chair. And I wrote names of victims of police brutality on a chair. Um, so the original people who made the chair, this is them, Charles and Ray Eames. So back in the 50s, I think it was the 50s, they said that the chair was a special refuge from the strains of modern day living. It's like this poetic thing. It's like, oh, you can lay in a chair and all your worries go away. So I was like, well, here's people who haven't been afforded that refuge. Um, and then we shipped the chair around the country. We had Instagram live discussions with different rappers, different groups, uh, all to raise money for the hip hop architecture camp and organizations who made refuge for uh, black children. Um, now the chair's at a, a museum in Wisconsin. Um, but yeah, but there was another brand who like, all right, how do we put our brand behind this idea? They caught a lot of flack. Um, one of the funniest things was on Instagram, somebody put a comment that said, once you go woke, you go broke. I'll never specify your projects, I mean your products or any of my projects anymore. And their CEO, uh, I hate this is on live, but I think, well, I'll say somebody at their company was like, I'm great that you expose yourself. We don't need you as a customer anyway. Um, so they like, really tapped into this idea. They're still a supporter to this day. They support camps and it's like, we can give you money, but how do we help you educate a broader community rather than tapping into the 40 kids you tap into each city? So I think that's the other thing is going back to some of the other questions. How do we broaden the message and the impact? Uh, so that's something I would love with all the powerful people in this room. Like, How can we not just impact a few kids here in San Francisco, but how do we broaden that to you know, people around the country? But uh, thanks for listening to me ramble some more. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael Ford. Please give it up for Michael Ford. And let me just say, I, the sheer genius to even create the program for the kids, because I'm just like, how did you even come up with that, right? It's amazing. So we are about to go to lunch, but our chair of the Human Rights Commission is going to um, share some important information about the, the specialness of this year. Well. I'm going to continue and thank you so much, Michael Ford. We appreciate everything that you're doing. And when you're talking about taking it national, let's take it global as well, right? Michael talked about his trip to Africa, his going home, his taking his uh, lovely wife and turning it into a family adventure. Well, we're all the family. We're all the family here. and. This is a special year because it is the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was written in 1948 by a committee of many, many nations and signed on to by everyone uh, at the time. Eleanor Roosevelt was the chair of that committee, the only woman uh, and one of the few Americans on the committee drafting the Universal Declaration. Go look it up, Google it, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This event, Pathways to Parity, uh, sponsored by us, the Human Rights Commission. Human rights are a national and international, a global movement. It's not just local, although all politics is local, right? But it's not just local. We are part of a huge movement, a tremendous effort by many, many people. 
And so while we think, oh, one person can't make a difference, we really can because we are with many others. Talking about the same thing, doing the same thing. So look up the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This Pathways to Parity is a kickoff in a way for our celebration this year. The anniversary is actually on December 10th. Our December 8th Human Rights Commission meeting will be dedicated to the anniversary. And as we're thinking, and I'm really totally <laughs> inspired by Michael and the use of hip hop, let's, let's look at the 50th anniversary of hip hop and the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration and bring it to our young people and ask them to bust some rhymes uh, about which article resonates for you um, and have a party and talk about this celebration and bring it forward so that the vote means something to everyone so that education and health care and housing and dignity, uh, the ability to marry and live as we see fit and not dictated to. And that's what this is really about. Before we go to lunch, I <coughs> think it's very important for us to be thankful, to be grateful that we are inside, we have food, and to acknowledge where we are. Under the leadership of tribal leaders, we were able to develop a land acknowledgement we also have supported the cultural district, district for the American Indian. And so as we look at land reclamation and rec reconciliation, let's acknowledge where we are. We acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land, and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community, and by affirming their sovereign rights as first peoples. Thank you. Thank you.